this morning is uh, uh, this is a message that I'm I am um, excited to give. It's a it's, it's a teaching message. Uh, it's a message that I, you know, for some of you you may not have heard this before. So some of you it might be something that you've heard before, a good refresher. Uh, but this is a message that is going to have a lot of scripture. So I have a lot of words up on the screen, but at the same time I hope you brought your Bibles. And I'm excited to teach the word this morning. Uh, really, it's a, it's, this, is a, this is great. You know, I think about how few times that we have together where we you know, really open up the word. And this is, this is one of those times where we open up the word. So, but nevertheless, this morning, I, 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 I can't help but start with a little bit of Calvin and Hobbes. Uh, this message is about worship. So uh, I don't know if you can see it up on the screen. You know, this bowl of lukewarm tapioca represents my brain. I don't know if you ever felt that way before. Um, I offer it in humble sacrifice, bestow thy flickering light forever. You know, you know that, that, uh, that uh, wonderful television that we spend so much time with, right? And the next one, O oh, great altar of passive entertainment, bestow upon me thy discordant images at such speed as to render linear thought impossible. And, of course, the TV does its job. It starts to shake. It starts to move. Wouldn't it be great if God was like, uh, like Calvin's television set, you know, that when we asked God to do something, when we said to do something, because we're such great worshipers, that God would jump up immediately and do exactly what we said every time. Wouldn't it be great if God succumbed to our own wishes? Wouldn't that be great? Just every time, just, you know, just, just serve us. God, serve me, serve me, serve me. Now, you know, of course, I'm just joking around. Um, we know that God's not like that, and we do, actually don't want God to be like that, right? I mean, God must be, has to be, right? A bigger God than that, that a God to succumb to our own, to our own little wishes. Well, Welcome to my third message this morning on worship. Uh, this, is, uh, the, the, uh, at, this is the last one I'm going to do for a while. It's on the topic of worship. I've uh, been preaching through Romans, but when we hit Romans chapter 1, um, right there in verse like 23, uh, well, I, it's one of those things where it's like, I've got to preach on worship here a little bit because Paul begins to get into that subject. So here we go. So this is my third subject on, on worship. Uh, worship, I've said the last two times, I've said that number one, that worship is, uh, is, uh, is about giving up our lives into the hands of Jesus Christ, just letting him be Lord, right? Worship is definitely about that. Uh, but, but as I said last week, worship is definitely a love journey. So it's talked a lot about love, and that worship is an expression of love, and so forth. Um, and worship is so central to our lives as Christians that, I mean, can you imagine if we just didn't worship together? You know, what, what if we didn't do that? What if we just, I don't know, I mean, got together over Facebook Messenger or something, right? Or, you know, maybe we just kind of got together occasionally in a small group somewhere at some point in time, but didn't get together and worship together. That would be, like, awful, right? It wouldn't be, wouldn't be, what it, somehow our Christian life would be missing a huge, We'd have a huge hole in our Christian life. Worship is so central. You know, I want you to think about it this way. Nazarenes are mission-focused people, and we should be. Uh, but I want you to just kind of consider this for just a moment. As crucial as mission is, mission actually has an ending. Right? Mission has an ending. Right now, we're at a time, we're in an age where the gospel is going out to the world, and it's crucial that we carry the gospel to the world, but at some, some point, this age is going to end. Jesus is going to return, right? Right? And mission, as we know it, as we understand it, is going to be over. Right? But will worship be over? Worship is an eternal gift that God has given us. Worship's never going to end. Uh, worship is, uh, is central to our lives. Okay? Now, today we enter into a discussion about what I call the mechanics of worship. Don't let that language uh, uh, confuse you. Um, I'm not talking about putting a quarter in a slot machine, right? Pulling the handle and hoping that our prayers, you know, the prayers that go in somehow result in, you know, exactly what we want coming out. God will reward us for praying in that way. 
You know, that somehow that, that worship is a mechanical kind of device that we, uh, that we, that we use or that we do. Uh, I'm not talking about that. For some people, that's what it is. You know, if I come to church just often enough, at least once every six months, if I come to church just often enough, God's going to like me, and I'm going to get the reward I'm really after, right? Larger bank account, whatever it would be. Um, for other people, worship is simply a, uh, it's, it's an enigma altogether. They, don't, they just don't even know why. Why would people get together on a Sunday morning and worship? What is that thing? They don't understand it whatsoever. Um, why can't I just go and, and, and approach God on the golf course, right? Why can't I just, just talk to God in my room? Well, you can, but there's people who don't understand it. Well, the good news this morning is that God actually wants to give us some light about worship. Uh, he wants us to understand what I would call the mechanics of worship. Now, I will tell you right now that, that, that I really hesitated to write down that, that phrase and to title the sermon that way because I thought people would be confused because God is highly personal. Uh, mechanics of worship. That's really, I, I really see that as more of an oxymoron, but I'm using it anyway. Uh, you know what an oxymoron is, right? Oxymoron. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples here. Uh, I think the most famous, most well-known example is jumbo shrimp, right? Right? Jumbo shrimp? How can you have jumbo shrimp? You know? I go to Costco and I look for shrimp in the freezer and they have a... I, I, used, to get, I used to get the little shrimp, you know, that, not the really super tiny ones, but the ones that you have to spend a lot of time shell, taking the shell off. I go for the little larger ones now. They're more the large shrimp. I don't know if they're jumbo, but whatever. Jumbo shrimp. Okay? I'm getting lazy as I get older. Right? Uh, you know, uh, when my... When my uh, when my, my son was born, he was a big baby, big baby, oxymoron, tiny elephant, right? You, get, you got the idea, right? Mechanics of worship. Worship is not mechanical in terms of machine, but nevertheless, there's a way, there's a method, there's some things that we need to pay attention to, and that's why I, uh, I, I, I kind of think of it as an oxymoron, uh, and this is the best picture I can come up with. Okay, so people have different mechanisms, different approaches for coming to God, and my goal is to show you that we as Christians have an advantage over the world in coming to God? I mean, after all, I ho certainly hope we do, right? Those who don't know Christ, I hope we have an advantage over those people, right? God loves them, but I hope that we as Christians have an advantage, right? And we have an advantage actually over the people who, of, our, of the past, God, the, God's people in, the, in, in, in past times. We have an advantage, right? Um, that, let's, let's begin by considering some of those early people from long ago, the way that they approached God. Let's go ahead and begin with Cain and Abel. After the fall, we read this. Okay? Now, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Now, there's all kinds of theories as to why uh, Cain's offering was rejected. Okay? I have my own views. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know, know on that. But, but uh, Cain, Cain's offering was rejected. But the thing I really want you to notice is right in the very beginning in the Bible, we see that worship is central. This is a worship act, right? I mean, this is right after the fall. And, and I, I trust that Adam and Eve, before the fall, before Eve was actually really named even, I trust that they had times of worship as they walk with God. Right? Wouldn't that be a worshipful experience? But here we have this story in chapter 4, right after the fall, and what's the first thing we hear about? The first thing we hear about is that they worship. Why is that? Because the Bible wants us to see, God wants us to see, that worship is central. It's critical to human life. Human life. Now, um, you know, I suspect, and this is just my suspicion about Cain, is that he brings his offering from the ground, it's rejected. Um, I suspect that Cain's heart wasn't right. That's a good Wesleyan answer, right? That his heart wasn't right, that uh, he wanted somehow to manipulate God, 
to get God. God was more like a slot machine, perhaps. Don't really know. Don't really know. Admit it. I admit that. Uh, I suspect that his heart wasn't right, though, and I suspect that Abel's heart, well, I think he had, probably had a sense of love, sense of devotion, something that pleased God uh, in his offering. Okay, Okay. so anyway, Cain and Abel, we, said, we begin right away in the Bible when we see this story about, uh, it begins with, with, with the worship. As soon as we go to Noah, we see, see, uh, see something happen again. Uh, Genesis chapter 8 tells us this story. After the flood, and there's a new beginning, right? After the flood, <clears throat> things are changing. My wife was here. I told her to go get me a drink of water, but that's okay. Um, <clears throat> Dave, would you give me a drink of water? Thanks, Dave. We have water bottles. <clears throat> hey, Dave, I have water bottles. I always forget about those. Thank you so much. <laughs> Christy, you're the best. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dave. I need that. I needed that. Okay, so, so it's Genesis 8. Then God said to Noah, this is after, right, after, right after the flood, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing that is with you uh, of all flesh, birds and animals and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, and every bird, everything that moves on the earth went out by families from the ark. And then notice what he does. Right then, right at the very beginning, right? What's the first thing that humanity is supposed to really do and what Noah recognizes is critical? Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. Amen. Right? I mean, it's, it, life starts really with worship. He built an altar to the Lord and took some from every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never curse the ground again. It's, that a, it's just an amazing statement about how worship is something that just pleases God. True worship. Right? Um, worship must be pretty important. It must be pretty important. Yeah. Um, and you know, the people in the world, although they don't understand what we do in a church service on a Sunday morning, the reality is that they know somewhere inside that they need to connect with God. Everyone wants to connect with God. We were made to be with God. It's a testimony here. Well, okay, so you have Cain and Abel, you have, uh, you have uh, Noah, and of course the beginning of faith, as we understand faith, comes from Abraham. Abraham is the one who the Israelites look to as the beginning of salvation, right? Because he's the man of faith. Okay, in uh, profound ways. So I want to read this story to you too. I want you to, we're giving some breath of scripture here this morning. Uh, Genesis 12, now the Lord said to Abram, and by the way, he's Abram at this point. Later on, he's called Abraham. But at this point in the story, he's Abram. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you, you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, when God tells Abram at this point to go from his family, he's leaving a big, a great culture behind. And he's, he, is, he is expressing incredible faith to leave. He hears God's voice, and he trusts God, whoever this God is, and he leaves. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took his Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of, at Shechem, to the oak of Marah, Mar, Mare. And at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. And look what Abram does. Abraham, look what he does. So he built an altar to the Lord. Somehow he knew, he knew just like Cain and Abel, just like Noah, he knew that something new was beginning, right? And so he worships. He worships, right? I, you know, I... I, I uh, 
Uh, I, I, I love to lead people to Jesus Christ. I love it when people come to the Lord and there's, a, there's just an awakening and the Holy Spirit comes into this person, man or woman, and, it's, and, and, and then you see them come to church and begin to change and they start looking forward to Sunday morning worship. I mean, when their lives are new in Christ, get into church, right? Get into church and hear the word of the Lord and begin to change. Abraham knew that he had to begin his new life with God by worshiping the Lord. Verse, uh, so, so this verse, verse 7, so he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there, look, once again, he does it again. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. That's a very important phrase. We're not going to talk about it, calling on the name of the Lord so much. But it's a very important idea here is that Abraham begins his, his life and he begins a pattern of worship is what really is going on here. We're developing a pattern of worship, right? First, he builds an altar to the Lord out of thanksgiving. And then he, a second time, he builds an altar to the Lord because he's just, he wants a close relationship with God. That's, that's the idea here. He wants a close relationship with God because he calls on the name of the Lord. Oh, man. One of the things about worship is that it is in our DNA. We are wired to worship. And that's why, that's why it was in Romans chapter 1, you know, we come to this worship language, and it's like, i got to talk about this. I've got to spend a little extra time on this. Romans 1. Remember that passage where Paul says, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. But what did they do? What did they do? They worshipped. They worshipped. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man or birds or animals or reptiles. Creeping things, as it says in the ESV. It doesn't matter that people can reject God all they want. Guess what? They're still wired to worship. They're going to worship. You know, I even think atheists worship. I just think they worship themselves. But they worship, right? We're made, to, we're made that way. We can't get around it, right? Now, people can decide to worship any way they want. We live in a free country. They're free to worship whatever, right? They can worship... Um, all kinds of creatures, uh, and they can worship any way they want. Uh, they, they, their deceived hearts can present any offering to anything they want. They can sing, they can dance, they can engage in, in, uh, in fertility dances if they want, right? I'm not kidding about that. They can worship themselves, because that's, that's, that's what a lot, much of the world in the world's history, that's what we see. Um, they can try to manipulate the divine all they want, the reality is, is that when you worship the creation, there's no life in it. Life only comes from God, right? Not from the creation. And this is what Paul's getting at in Romans 1. But if you decide to worship the creator, this is stuff that's not easy, right? One of the problems with knowing God or knowing that you want to know God enough to worship God, is that God actually requires of you and requires of me to come to him, to him in a sacred way. We, uh, we certainly got that from Cain and Abel's story, right? They come and Cain's, Cain's offering is rejected. And what happens with Cain? He has this anger and it destroys him. It hurts him, right? We have a hint here of danger in God and, danger, and God is a very dangerous God. I mean, after all, we're talking about fear, People of Israel, right? The people of Israel, they're given, they're given um, the, 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 the priesthood. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But there's a great story in Leviticus uh, that goes like this. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. How would you like that to happen here? This morning. You know, if, 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 if we did something, if I did something that was unholy before the Lord, and I was trying to manipulate God to do something for me, for my benefit perhaps, to get God to do whatever I wanted God to do, and fire came down from heaven and consumed me. What would you think? Right? 
It's actually a story in the New Testament about, about people uh, who came to God in a manipulative, deceiving way, and they died on the spot. To worship God is, is, to, is to open yourself up to a dangerous activity. Because one of, the, one of the great lessons that the Old Testament gives us is God is a consuming fire. God is dangerous. God is loving, but God is very dangerous, right? And this is one of the things that the Old Testament is trying to tell us, uh, and preparing us for the New Testament. And, and so many of us know the story. I've, I've talked about this story not too long ago. I told you this is a, covering a breadth of Scripture, a lot of Scripture here. But remember the story in Isaiah 6. What's the story of Isaiah 6, right? When Isaiah comes and he has this great vision in Isaiah 6. Remember that story? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one, of them, uh, and, and one called to another and said, Holy, 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 is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. You see, with the smoke, there's fire. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the presence of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. One of the great things, one of the foundational things that the Old Testament is trying to teach us is that God is dangerous. You know, we come to worship in such a casual way, and I think it's good that we, you know, shake hands, greet one another, enjoy being one together. And sometimes we, we encourage people to, you know, get up and say hello to your neighbor and so forth. I think that's really important, you know, particularly from a New Testament perspective. I think we can do that, right? But, the, but may we never forget that God is a dangerous God. God's holy, and God is a consuming fire. When we come to worship God, let's be careful, and let's ask God to help us. See, let's do that. Do you know what the central issue is that the Old Testament brings up for, for, for like, the issue, the issue of all issues? This is the biggest one that the Old Testament brings up for, for us as human beings. Don't forget this. This is the foundational issue. This is it. God is holy and we are not. Now, the New Testament, you know, sheds light on this and helps us to, you know, become holy. But the reality is human beings are not holy. This is the problem that the Israelites had. God's holy and they're not holy. What are they going to do? The Old Testament never answers how that problem is solved. But it gives little, little uh, it gives pictures. Okay, so now we got to the point, all right, where I'm going to talk about three mechanisms. Remember the, the mechanisms of worship. That's how I titled the sermon, okay? Three possible mechanisms that, we, that the Bible presents to us. Ways in which we can approach God. Okay, number one, we can be our own priest. We can be our own priest. We read about that with Abel and Cain, right? You think about that. There was no priesthood. They came to God themselves. Essentially, they were, when they presented offerings, that's a priestly act. They presented offerings, and so they were, you know, somewhat priests themselves. And Abel, for some reason, that offering was received, but a Cain's wasn't, probably because Cain was doing it on his own terms, right? And this is the central problem with being priests to ourselves, is that Somehow, you know, well, uh, you know, we're not always doing the right thing. Um, you know, and uh, somehow our hearts are not right. And let's be honest, this New Testament teaches us that the humanity is sinful. And the wages of sin is death. And so, the world thinks it can worship God on its own, be its own priest, each individual their own priest, but the problem is, is that sin keeps people out of relationship with God. And if sin is not dealt with, then those people, I don't care what they do, they can light the biggest fire that you've ever seen. God's not impressed. Right? I mean, being one's own priest is like being your own surgeon. Right? Isn't it really like being your own surgeon, being your own priest? 
Because what are you being a priest for? You're a priest for yourself. You're going to take care of your sin. You're going to take care of your problem. And you can't do it. You can't do it. It doesn't work very well. And this is why Paul comes to this, this great statement, and he's actually quoting one of the Psalms, but this great statement in Romans 3, verses 10b through 11, where he says, none is righteous. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Now, we know from the Old Testament there are a few that really they did do some sort of seeking, but we also know that Paul's thinking this way that look at, look at humanity. They're a bunch of sinners. The only way that people really seek for God is to get God to, man, to be manipulated to do what, God, what, what, he, what that person wants God to do for them. That's how humanity comes to God. No one understands that you can't come to God that way. No one really seeks for God. Coming as our own priest doesn't work. It doesn't work. It does not work. Humanity is sinful. All right? We need help. God is holy. God's dangerous. But thank goodness God loves us. And he has given us another mechanism. Now, mechanism number two. We can come to God through God's choosing of other people to be priests. That's what God did for the Israelites. He gave them the Levitical priesthood. The Levites were one of the tribes, and they were set out as priests to help the people come to God. Um, you know, let's be honest. When people read the Bible, they get very confused. Right? Um, they start out with good intentions. They read, in Gen they read Genesis, filled with great stories. They get to Exodus. Some good stories in there, but then, uh, you know, it gets more difficult. By the time you get to Leviticus, it's really, really tough stuff. Most people, they start to read the Bible, they finish in Leviticus. They never get beyond it. The ki Leviticus kills Bible readers. And the reason for that is because the book of Leviticus is a law code for the priests. The Levitical priesthood, that's what it's for, Right? So you're reading the code for the, for the priests, and it's filled with details, okay? Why is it filled with so many details? Because the Levitical priesthood had to do everything exactly right because they were going to be the representatives of the people before God. And once a year, the high priest was going to go into the Holy of Holies. We're talking about the temple here, the tabernacle and the temple. The, once a year, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and representatively would care, right, essentially the sins of the people, this is representatively, you know, uh, he would represent them before God, he would take the blood and he put it on the uh, mercy seat and so forth, and in a sense that everything was going to be okay for a year now, right? So every year the high priest would go in to the Holy of Holies. Now the book of Hebrews tells us about this, it makes a reference to this this way, Hebrews chapter 5, I know I'm giving you a lot of scripture today. Isn't it great? It's great. Yeah, it's great. A lot of scripture today. Okay, teaching sermon. Hebrews chapter 5, uh, verse 1 says, For every high priest, he's talking about the Levitical priesthood, every high priest chosen among men is appointed to act on behalf of men, to representative, see, on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant, see, those who don't understand, those who don't know, and the wayward, those who go the wrong direction, he can deal with them, since he himself is beset with weakness. He himself has that same problem. Because of, because of this, he, uh, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when God has called him, just as Aaron was. Aaron was the first high priest. So what we have here is this kind of this... Um, this, this, this great gift of God, he, gives, he raises up this priesthood to represent the people. It's another way to, to come to God, to get into the place we all really want, which is to be in close relationship with God. He gives the priesthood this opportunity to go into the Holy Holies once a year. It's the place where heaven touches earth, and it's just this once a year, this once experience for the priest, and somehow, representatively, somehow we get to experience God. Do you really get to experience God? I mean, you're sitting here, you're among the people, Right? You're one of the people, right? You're, you're, you're kind of like, maybe even in the outer court, right, of the, of the temple. Do you really get to experience God? The priest is experiencing God in some profound way. 
theoretically, you're experiencing that. No, it's not, not really what we really need. It's not what we want. It's not enough. It's just not enough. You know, God, I want to be in relationship with you. I want to be close to you. It's, you've given us this way in which we know we're okay, but it's not enough. I want more. I want more. I want more. You know, can't I be a priest to myself? No, that doesn't work because you're such a sinner. Can't you give us a way to be close to you? A way to be close to you? And yes, indeed, God gives a way for us to be close to him, to have an incredible relationship with him. So God gives us, not ourselves as priests, although in the New Testament we become priests, but that's another sermon. Doesn't give us a Levitical priest, but he gives us Jesus Christ as our high priest. Amen. Oh, we finally got there in this part of the sermon, right? In the sermon. Jesus Christ is high priest. Now, truthfully, we do not talk about Jesus Christ as priest often enough. I think Protestants are uncomfortable with the whole concept of priesthood. I'll never forget coming to this church and I was teaching a class on, um, well, um, I think I was in Revelation at the point in time. Anyway, it made, makes a reference to priesthood. And I remember one of the persons in the class said, I've never heard that we're priests. And I'm really not comfortable with this. And then we went to a long discussion about what does it mean for Christians to be priests. But I just think that we as Christians are not really comfortable, or exactly as Protestants are not really comfortable with the idea of priesthood. And so we kind of ignore Jesus as priest. We kind, of, we kind of say, okay, I'm comfortable with Jesus as king. He rules. He's Lord. Great. I'm even kind of comfortable with Jesus as prophet. He speaks the truth. That's kind of hard sometimes, but I accept it. Right? He's Lord. But Jesus is priest? Do I need a priest? Can't I just go to God on my own? Right? Why do I need a priest? Let me tell you something. You need a priest. You need a priest. There's only one who can be that priest, and it's Jesus. You know why Jesus can be the, the priest that we need? Because Jesus is fully God. And he's fully human. Just like in Romans or Hebrews 5, where it was saying that one can identify that the high priest could identify with, with those who are coming to bring their offerings, Jesus identifies with us fully. When he was on that cross, he was fully identifying with our humanity. When he lived his life, he was fully identifying with our humanity. Jesus is one of us. You notice I said today that it said Jesus is our brother. Jesus is our brother. He's our elder brother, but he is one of us. Don't forget that. He is one of us. When he ascended into heaven, do you think he ascended in the spirit? He ascended bodily as well as the spirit. Jesus is in, in heaven, in the heavenly realms, as a human being, as well as God. He's both. You see, it's so critical that we understand that. Um, and, this, and, and the truth is, there is no communication, there is no mediation. There is no help, not the help that we really need and not the communication we really want without Jesus Christ as the high priest who goes before us. Now, this has profound implications in terms of our prayer life. Profound, right? Now, let me, let me just share with us this, this one thing. The Christians today love to quote this verse, John 14, 6, right? What Jesus says to his disciples says, she says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know how most of us interpret that? Jesus came 2,000 years ago. He did his work, right? He did his work on the cross 2,000 years ago. He died for our sins. Now the way's open. We're good. We come through him because we trust what he did back then. Isn't that how we normally think of it? So many of us think of it that way. We come to, we come to God because of what Jesus did back then 2,000 years ago. Hallelujah. And you know what? Yes, that's true in a sense. But it's not enough. It's not enough. We don't come just because of what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. You know why we come to the Father now? Because Jesus is there before the Father right now. He's the priest right now. He's our priest right now. He's our human being right now. He's our brother right now. He's before God right now. He's with God right now. There's a conversation going on right now. You see? Right now. Right? He's praying that this message gets through to all of us this morning. God has come to us, and God carries us 
into the heavenly realm when we pray. Now, I know this for, for one thing is John 14, 6. Clearly, it's about this present tense idea that Jesus, that, that, that um, this present tense idea that no one comes. No one, it's a continuation in the, in the Greek text. It's a, it's a continuous action. No one continually comes except through me. And then you look at Hebrews 8, verse, verses 1, 1 and 2. Look at this. Now, the point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. He is a minister, a servant, a servant. The Greek word, you don't necessarily care about the Greek word, but it's liturgos. He a, serves, he serves, continually serves. It's the idea. He, he ministers in the holy places. What's the holy places? It is the, the picture that the Old Testament gives us is the, uh, is, is, the, uh, is the Holy of Holies, the inner temple, right? The very Holy of Holies, the, the high priest went. Now we have Jesus going to the Holy of Holies in the heavenly realm, always serving, serving us in, the, in this place. What's that? It's the Trinity. It's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And how is Jesus serving in that place? How is he ministering in that place? Even now, how is he ministering? He's having a conversation. He's talking about us. He's talking about you. And guess what? Yesterday, is in the, uh, when I talked a little bit about Evelyn, who left us and is with Jesus, I, I, I said, look, look, I can imagine Evelyn right now kind of tugging on Jesus' robe, Right? And, and saying, hey, hey, Jesus, you know, uh, remember, my, remember my boys and my, my, my sons and my daughter and my husband, right? Because in her heart, and I don't fully understand, don't get me wrong, I don't fully understand the whole afterlife thing with Jesus right now at this point in time. I know Jesus is coming back soon. But, but there's a conversation always going on, right? And guess what? We get to enter into that conversation. So when we pray, we're entering into the conversation of the Trinity. God is talking about us. He's talking to us. He's talking to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, check out, check, check out Mary over here. I love Mary. Mary. Isn't Mary cool? Oh, yeah, Mary's the greatest. I don't really know what they're saying, but I know they're talking about how much they love you. They're, they're, they're talking about how, how, you know, how we can uh, develop a greater prayer life and how we can come to him. We need to re remember that we go to God through Jesus, the high priest. We don't go to God on our own. We go to the Son because he's helped us come to himself. He's called us. Now, of course... There's a profound mystery here because there's a sense in which we do go to God on our own, right? And yet may we never forget, never forget that Jesus is the one who carries our prayers before the Son, before the Spirit, and before the Father. And this is a profound thing. This is so important because sometimes, let's be honest, I'll just go one, one application here. And I know I'm going a long, long, long time, but I'm just going on this. Anyone here think they know how to pray? I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I'm the pastor. The pastor knows how to pray. I don't know how to pray. I guess I just fall on my knees and ask Jesus to help me. Amen. You know? And by the way, I take this one step further. Remember, remember what Paul says in Romans 8. The Spirit prays too, right? Yeah. The Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. We don't know how to pray, he says. Hey, but the Spirit intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. Aren't you glad that we've got a conversation going on? God is three. And he's come to us. This is great news for us. That we get to be with God. Who just loves us. And will never stop talking about us. Let's pray. Oh, dear Jesus, sometimes we have forgotten about the fact that you are our brother and our high priest, and you've made us priests, but that's another sermon. <laughs> I am so thankful that we have God who prays for us. I don't really even know what that means. <laughs> no, it's just good. It means something good. And so, Lord, we are so thankful. Uh, for what you have done, and for what you're doing in our lives today. May Jesus Christ be lifted up, because we know when he's lifted up, our prayers are lifted up. And Lord, you love us.
Thank you for being you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <laughs>